OK, we have a new Galaxy S7, and it's the Active, as expected, but only for AT&T in the USA. What? Shame. I hate these sort of carrier exclusives. But I'm sure this will make its way to other markets after the allotted number of weeks. The S7 Active still has the Snapdragon 820 chipset, 4GB of RAM and 32GB of expandable storage, but now the 5.1-inch QHD display is shatter-resistant, with an added layer of plastic and the larger form factor includes a 4,000 mAh battery. The cracks are starting to show in the smartphone world, I believe, under incredible pressure from Chinese manufacturers, Huawei, Meizu, Xiaomi. Uh, the old guard are having to change tack and try something different just to survive. So we had LG in the ill-fated detachable bottom module, and now Sony has abandoned its three sizes strategy in favor of the same size, but having three levels of specification with the Xperia X here, the first to be available. Hmm. While I applaud the choice of specifications in the same form factor, I do think this strategy is potentially more confusing in the long run. Also, and this is becoming something of a theme in my reviews, but in the light of the incredible value handsets coming out of China, I just don't think the old guard of smartphone manufacturers can charge the top dollar they used to at £450 here for the Sony Xperia X, and often more, it's still at least £100 too expensive. You see, the Xperia X, despite ostensibly replacing the Z5 flagship and priced similarly, is on the face of it a lot further down the specification ladder. And that makes no sense at all. What on earth are Sony smoking? For example, the Xperia X here has a Snapdragon 650 chipset. The Z5 had a full Snapdragon 810. Yes, I know that chip families aren't everything, but the X does struggle rather with their really graphics intensive games, whereas the Z5 was just fine. Then there's the waterproofing or apparent lack of it. One of the unique selling points of Sony Z series was that whether through flaps or sealed ports, the phones could survive a dunking. Not so the X, at least officially. What I suspect has happened is that a number of people ruined their Z series by trying to use it underwater, as per the original promo ads, with less than perfect flap seals. And so Sony did a U-turn on their official advice. They've still put basic water seals inside the X, I suspect, so it should still survive a two second dunk in a basin or toilet. But they're not going to make any kind of promotional mistake in terms of advertising that fact. On the imaging side of things, the Xperia Z5 could shoot in full 4K, but the X can only manage 1080p, despite its 650 chipset officially supporting 4K. Maybe another instance of Sony playing things very, very safe, given the number of users reporting overheating of their Z5s when shooting in 4K. And so on, playing it safe all the way down the line. The Xperia X is certainly not a shabby phone, far from it. It's downright beautiful in a slightly boring sort of way, and the feel in the hand is lovely, with all that lovingly curved where needed metal meets glass. The display is full 2.5D, meaning that the toughened glass falls away on all four edges in a rather ergonomic way. The sides are tough aluminium, the back also made of metal, but much thinner. The X is an utterly generic Xperia. Great if you love the brand and design. Unremarkable if you're looking at it from a, a wider context. It's available in rose gold, uh, lime gold. What? Black has here and white. I guess the advantage of using aluminium is that it's trivial to anodize in whatever colors you want. Anyone else remember the green Nokia N8? Calling the X mid-range is unfair. Despite the chipset, which at least is quite new, most of the other specifications are very respectable indeed. But the, the X demonstrably isn't a flagship, as in competing with the usual suspects, HTC 10, Samsung Galaxy S7. And so it needs to be £350 SIM free or less. We already have phones coming from the likes of Huawei's Honor brand, which are going to eat Sony's lunch, as it were, by producing phones with similar specs and ambitions for half the price. But lay the price aside, there's still quite a bit worth mentioning and testing on the Xperia X. Apart from that headline chipset choice, there's three gigabytes of RAM, 32 gig of internal storage, plus micro SD. The latter supported in the type of dual card tray first seen in Huawei's phones. Uh, one less tray to worry about here, I guess, and one less flap. One consequence is that Sony forces a 
restarted the device whenever you pull the tray out. They figured that a change of SIM and or a change of card should be accompanied by a reboot. And they're probably right, but it's something to be aware of since the restart comes without any other warnings. Top and bottom on the front of the usual Z series, I mean X series stereo speakers. These do the job, but they're nowhere near as loud as those on the Nexus 6 and 6P, for example. And a somewhat tinny. Here's an example. This is maximum volume. There's just lots of middle and semi top end. It's pretty much zero fidelity, and the volume's not that high either. The standard 5-inch display for this series, the X series, is 1080p here, LCD and quite bright with great viewing angles. True, the bezels are a little large, but then those front stereo speakers have to live somewhere, so I'll cut the X some slack here. Also under the hood is NFC, which will tie in nicely with the side power button mounted fingerprint sensor to enable Android Pay, a service rolling out in many countries now, so you can pay for things in shops with your Xperia X, which is pretty cool. Unusually, the NFC antenna is here on the front of the phone at the top left and with a little sticker added out of the box, by the way, which I've taken off to let users know. The jury's out on whether this will work out more or less convenient for end users, but it's highly odd at the very least and worth noting. Unlike on the Huawei and LG phones, there's no one touch unlock and power on. You have to physically press the side power button, at which point the fingerprint recognition kicks in quickly. I'm OK with the requirement for physical action here. A one touch system on a side button would lead to far too many accidental screen on events. The 2620 milliamp hour battery is sealed, but is quick charge two compatible and Sony's track record at keeping phones going longer than most is excellent. Stamina mode here, plus that lower spec chipset, plus Android 6's dose characteristics, it all adds up to stellar standby time. Many days of light use on a single charge, uh, even if heavy use, will still see the phone drained in a day. Charging and cable data is handled by micro USB. It's disappointing to see that Sony hasn't moved with the times here to USB type C. The upshot here would be many people will still be using the X in 2018 on their two year contract. Well, almost every mid range or top end phone around them will be using type C and micro USB jacks will probably be in the minority in geek households. Anyway, Sony touts its phone cameras as being superior, but they're they're really not. True, there are lots of things to play with. There's a large one over 2.3 inch sensor, F over 2.0 aperture, basic oversampling and lossless zoom Nokia style. But by every quality metric I could throw at them. Images from the Xperia X were noticeably inferior to those from the other 2016 contenders, the Lumia 950, HTC 10, Samsung Galaxy S7. Mushy rendering of greenery, blurry detail and low light thanks to no OIS. Dodgy focusing on close-up subjects, weak LED flash, I could go on. Just disappointing at every turn. You do get pretty fast phase detection autofocus and a two-stage shutter key here to help launch the camera rapidly and to take shots in conventional fashion, plus a volume key positioning that's optimised for zoom rather than actually volume in phone calls, which is fair enough. But none of these are enough to save the X's camera and certainly not enough to justify the purchase price. There's quite a bit of software added to Sony's Android smartphone still, Admittedly, most of it can be uninstalled if you want, so it's hard to complain too much, but I will anyway. In addition to the all usual Google and Android fare, there's Sony's own music, album and video applications, PlayStation, LifeLog, Movie Creator, Sketch, Track ID, Xperia Lounge, Sony Support, Sony Diagnostics, plus partner installs of Spotify, Facebook, Amazon, Cobra, eBooks, AVG, Antivirus, quite a list. The interface itself is remarkably close to stock Android in terms of launcher, dock, notifications and setting shades. So with five minutes effort removing stuff, you can get fairly close to a Nexus experience. At the end of each review period, it's quite telling to examine my own emotions in terms of returning a handset to the relevant press office. With the HTC 10, I had to have the device prized from my enthusiastic hands. Well, I couldn't wait to throw the uh, finger cutting, bleeding LG G5 back in the box and get it out of the house. The Sony Xperia X elicits, well, no emotion at all, really. If it stayed here, then it would be in a draw. It's a premium priced Android mid-ranger with no unique selling point whatsoever other than the Sony brand. 
I'm sorry, Sony, I really am. I want to love your smartphones. The build, the design, the camera, the display, the speakers all have the potential to be jaw dropping. And they just aren't. The Xperia X is a very good smartphone, but it's not better than the competition and it's more expensive than most of it.